single day. Today we begin a two-part study on the theme of the Bible, really. God says, if you will be my people, then I am able to be your God. We have to make the decision to become a part of his family if we want for him to be our God. And if we are in that place today, and I know that that is where you want to be, then these will be the words of our hearts this morning. Please stand with me for the reading of God's word from Psalm 73 this morning. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Powerful words this morning. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we come into your holy presence, knowing that we can only enter in because we are covered in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We thank you for that covering today, knowing that we have not done anything to deserve it, but it is only in your love that we can stand before you, great Father and sweet Savior and Holy Spirit, to come and worship on this beautiful Sabbath morning. We want these words from Psalm 73 to be at the core of our being. We want to sing these songs. We want to know these words. We want these words to be bread. And water. And so this morning as we desire to submit ourselves to you. We ask that you would come, Lord, and fill our hearts and our minds with your presence so that we would not be distracted or disturbed and deterred in any way from focusing only on you. We thank you for the blessings of this day. In Jesus' name, amen. I know that you are walking with the Lord, that you are having days, some days that you feel defeated, and you have other days where you have victory, such as the life of God's people. Because of who we are, we are fighting the good fight of faith. In the midst of that, one thing has to be planted in our hearts. And this morning, this is the scripture that God gave me for those that desire to be one with him. There can be nothing else on this planet that satisfies, that completes us, that moves us more than Christ Every morning we have to be able to say, what does this earth offer that would want to make me move Jesus off the throne of my heart? No matter what happens to me, no matter what comes into my life, no matter what I'm dealing with, God is my strength. He is my refuge. Look at this last line. He's my portion. He is your portion. I can't even digest that one thought this morning. It is so huge. But God says, I am yours and you are mine. So it's fitting that we would start this morning in... Isaiah chapter 43, I invite you to open up God's word with me this morning and to look at these words and to just be filled 
with God's word today. I hope that this is one of the passages that you have memorized that you know in your heart. It's one of my favorite passages. People of God, one day we may be all alone. We may be in some prison cell. We may be in a place where we have nothing unless we have God's word in our hearts, where we can recite, where we can declare God's word back to him. It is imperative. It is the greatest need that we have. It is what keeps us focused because God isn't who we think he is. God is not who we feel he is. God is who he says he is as declared in his word. And if you are not in the word, you will not know who God really is. This is who he declares himself to be. And this is what he says in Isaiah 43. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. I have summoned you by name. He knows your name, Abby. He knows your name, Addie Rose. He knows your name, Gavin David. He knows your name. Wow. There's nothing like someone knowing you by name, is there? When someone comes up to you that you haven't seen in a while, and you might not remember their name, but they call you by name, it's like, there's something about being known by name. The creator of the universe says, don't be afraid. I know you by name. Look at verse 4. Since you are precious and honored in my sight and because I love you. You are precious. You are honored in his sight. And he loves you. Do you know that you know that you know that you are loved every single day? Does that propel you out of bed in the morning? You are loved by your redeemer. He is waiting for you. He wants to spend time with you. Is that important to you? We're going to be talking this morning about being a part of God's family. And being a part of God's family is not one-sided. It's two-sided. If God says, because I've given you the power of choice, if you choose to be mine, then... I can be yours. What does that mean? God says, everyone who is called, verse 7, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made, made to glorify him. These are things that we need to allow the spirit to sear into our heads because the days ahead are what Christ says they're going to be. Do you take your God at his word? Do you know that in his word he says what is coming is unlike any other time in earth's history? We can look back and see many horrible times in earth's history. He says, no, it's not like that. It's beyond and worse than anything you have ever known. And I need for you to be prepared for this time. And one of the things that is in the foundation of being prepared is knowing that you are loved, that you are precious, that you are treasure, that he is everything that you need, that he is enough that he will protect you, that he is your provider, that he is your sustainer, that he is your Jehovah Jireh. You must know without a doubt, you must be secure in his love regardless of what's going on in your life. 
regardless of your struggle right now, of your circumstance, he must be enough. And you must know that his grace is sufficient for what you are dealing with in this day because he has promised it so in his word. He is who he says he is. Now, will you be who you are declaring to be? Why do you want to be a part of God's family? This morning, why? The answer should be, because he loves me, and I love him. I know his love. Who wouldn't want to be in the presence of someone who wants nothing but good and best for you? And when he is the king of glory, wow, I want to be a part of his family because that is the best place to be in his presence, at his feet, under his authority, because he's everything. So our response to what God says that we are comes with responsibility and accountability, something that is not truly known today. We're going to go there to 1 Peter, even though I know that you have this memorized as well. This is another excellent passage to memorize because God declares, you know, back in the book of Exodus, God declares who his people are. He says, I'm going to take you and make you my treasured possession. Out of all the nations, you're going to be my treasured possession. It wasn't because they were grand. You know their story. It was because they were going to be carriers of the truth about God. The message made them treasure because they were going to possess the treasure. Our treasure is the truth about God, the gospel story about God. That's what makes us this place of being a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people that belong, family, people that belong to God and declare his praises because we have been brought out of darkness. We've been brought out of the darkness of sin and living for self and living a self-centered life. God's brought us into the life of humility and unselfishness and patience and kindness and goodness. I so appreciate the last several weeks of the messages that we've heard, and I love how God ties things together because as Christopher started with the glorious message of God being good, he's good all the time. And that message could have, I mean, we could have done a 52-week message on how good God is and explored 52 different qualities of God's goodness and just be a drop in the bucket. And... Uh, the message about prosperity and what true prosperity is. This is the prosperous life that we're talking about here, being a part of God's family. And we can't have that without the prayer life, which is what Mike talked about last week. I, I so appreciate serving with men of God who just want to love and serve God and who want to declare his, his goodness. So I, I thank you both for that refreshment of the last five weeks. It's been tremendous. And I want to encourage us to remember who we are. This is who we are. Because this is who God says that we are. What does that mean to be these things? Well, let's look 
who he's talking to, but you, those of you who are in Christ, that's who he's talking about, are a chosen people. God shows whosoever believeth in me is chosen because they play their yes card. You know, they have yes or no to, to deal, to play every day to the Holy Spirit, yes or no. You are a royal priesthood. What does that mean? You are serving the king of heaven. You are a priest. The priests in, in God's day, they served in the temple. You and I are that. We are serving our king. And we are a holy nation. People that don't want to live impure lives. We want to live holy lives. We're not that. We're not perfection yet, except by faith. But one day we will be. And in the meantime, we are experiencing God's transforming grace every single day and being more grounded in the truth and growing in our relationship with him. That is who we are. We must know that we are responsible and accountable, and it is our job to protect the family name. It is our job to respect the family name. We bear a great name. Do you get that this morning? We belong by adoption. We have been adopted into the family of God. And when you get adopted, you get a new name. We have a new last name. We belong to the family of God. Are we interested in being a benefit to the king and his kingdom? If you are not, then you really don't belong to the family. And we're just going through the motions. I want you to ask these things. I want you to write down so you will remember every day when you read this passage, when you have a chance to rehearse this passage, it should be one that we memorize. This is who God says I am. And that means that I must be a benefit to the king and his kingdom. It's not because I'm so wonderful and I can just live a woohoo, do whatever I want to do, which is what the church seems to be doing. A very necessary thing here is that you and I realize that the church and I'm not talking about the building, I'm talking about the church, is, comp is, is damaged, every one of us. We're broken people, we're damaged people, sin has polluted us, we're, the Spirit is dealing every day with pollution extraction from each one of us, changing us, molding us, refining us. It's an ongoing process, and as we understand that for ourselves, we have to be able to be dispensers of grace to those around us. You and I, we can't perform perfectly. God's not in, looking, at a, looking to us for a performance, but if we can't perform perfectly, why do we expect others to? Why do we expect of others what we can't do ourselves? So being a part of God's family means understanding that our place to benefit the king in the kingdom is to be about soul winning and soul building. We, we win souls for Christ just in how we do life, in how we drive our car, in how we stand in line, in how we do business, in how we go to school, in how we go to work, in how we treat others every single day. We're building up God's kingdom. And then to encourage, especially, especially Scripture says, the family of God, those that are desiring to be a part of God's family. 
it, is it our deepest and greatest desire to be an encourager of others? To come into any place and encourage and think about lifting others up, to listen to what the Spirit is saying, that, that's part of being a, the priesthood, is benefiting the king. He can use us to do his work. Jesus isn't here right now, and if he was, he could only serve the people in his circle. He would expect us to be going out, like he sent the disciples out, to bless others. Are we taking that to heart as we wake up in the morning to be filled by the Lord, to allow him to give us his word and to put it in our hearts? Are we saying, Lord, I want to be a benefit to you? I want to please your heart first and foremost, and then I want to be a benefit to your kingdom. If you will be mine, then I can be yours. Ephesians 4 is all about bearing in love. It's a chapter that we should read weekly. It's a great compass for holy living. And then there's Romans 13.10. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Wow. Do we live lives to do no harm to someone else? with our words, with our actions? Are we living to benefit the kingdom? If we are not being prepared today to be a benefit of the kingdom, how can we think when we enter into the worst time of earth's history that we, in that time, the church, would be willing to go into the king's action and the king's work. It won't happen. Don't delude yourselves. It will not happen. Revelation 11 is about the purging of the church because of the imposters that exist, pretending, pretending. We can't pretend. We have to allow the Lord to fit us today, to fit us each day so that we can live a life that benefits, that pleases his hearts. We are people of faith. We live by faith. It's impossible to please God without faith. We believe that God is who he says he is. We believe that God is going to do what he says he is. And we believe that God loves us the way that he says he does. And that does not include him writing us checks every day for whatever we want. Every single day, I'm going to make it, give you money so you can go buy whatever you want. He is a God who is faithful to provide what we need. And a lot of times what we need is rebuke. A lot of times what we need more is chastisement. And then if those don't work, scourging is right around the corner because God disciplines those he loves. And you and I, we need discipline every day. Don't let your heart be ruled by what you see. Right now, everyone is dealing with things. Every one of us, we're dealing with health issues, we're dealing with emotional issues. Some are dealing with mo the mourning of their hearts, and they just can't, they can't get their head above water. Some people are in need of great direction. We are all in this together with trouble and problems and things that we need, and God knows all of that. And we can't think because we don't see something happening that God isn't working. 
He's always working. We live by faith and not by sight. Every day we say, Lord, I know that you're working things for my good because I love you. I am in your family. I am living to live the plumb line of your love and of your law, and I want to be in the center of your will. Lord, you are the authority over me. I live under your authority. I love your authority. I love your boundaries. I love your promises. I love you, and I am not needing you to send me an, a text message telling me what's going to happen tomorrow because I trust you. See, we want God to tell us so that we don't have to wait. Yeah, don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. We don't like waiting, but in the waiting, God is building us up to be a mighty nation, a mighty priesthood, holy people. as part of God's family. And I've said this before, but it's, it is worth repeating. That as, as part of his ambassadorship, no one should ever be uncomfortable in our presence. We should have a warm heart and open arms for anyone at any time. If someone feels uncomfortable because of what we believe, that's not our problem. If someone feels uncomfortable because we won't partake in what they're doing, that's not our problem. But we must, we must be people that benefit the kingdom by being willing to bear in love, to do no harm, and to live under God's authority so that we know exactly what we are to do and when we are to do it. No matter how much we love Jesus and how much we're submitted to him, it's not going to keep us out of trouble because God has promised in this world you will have trouble. And some trouble comes that we're not even looking for. Sometimes trouble comes that we had nothing to do with. It just comes and sits right on our table, and that's life. And God says, be prepared. I'm wanting for you to learn how to deal with trouble so that you will be able to stand and not be shaken so that you will not fall away. I don't believe there's anyone who dealt with trouble more than Job. So let's turn to the book of Job. right before the book of Psalms. Look at what God says about Job, because this is what he wants to be able to say about each one of us. I want you to understand that what Job went through is what the level of severity of trouble that is coming when we step inside the great tribulation. God says that Job was blameless, verse 1. He was blameless and upright. He feared God, greatly respected God, and he shunned evil. Does not mean that Job was perfect. Blameless does not be perfect. Let me tell you what blameless is. You hear a lot about the, the great reset that's being thrown around. This is the great reset. The great reset for each one of us, and we can hit this button 10 times a day if we need to. It's always available. It's called repentance. And you reveal your maturity as quickly as you can press this button from the time that you do something wrong and you make it right. That shows the giant of your maturity or not. Job lived to please the Lord and he knew what this word meant. Anytime you see the word blameless, we can't be blameless without this. We can't. It's impossible. 
I can only be blameless if I'm willing to do what is right. And so when I don't, then I do what is right. You get that? When I don't do what is right, God gives me a reset button, and I'm not going to hit that reset button if I'm not walking in humility because repentance requires humility. It requires me being becoming nothing and turning from my sin, recognizing, confessing the disgust of sin, even if it's just what we would consider one little bad thought or one little bad word we need to understand any little of any kind of sin is repulsive and disgusting in God's sight. God's never going to whitewash sin. Never. Never. And so God is saying this about Job. It's a tremendous thing. You know the story. Job is living this out. God can call on him to benefit him in his name and to benefit his kingdom. When he surveys, when Satan comes calling and God surveys the earth and he decides who will benefit his name and who will benefit his kingdom. And look how this story has benefited the kingdom since this got written out. Every one of us has benefited. And he, he chooses Job because Job had allowed God's transforming grace to change him to this point. doesn't mean he's perfect, but he's willing to come under God's authority and live under God's authority. So it's a tremendous thing what happens to Job. None of us have ever suffered like this. None of us to lose everything. You know, God had given him a lot, and then God took it all away, and one day he loses all his possessions, and then worse, he loses all his family, all his children, and it is a horrifying situation, and verse, tw- let's look at verse 20, let's look at Job's response and why God picked him. God knew the heart of Job because Job knew the heart of God. At this, Job got up. He tore his robe and he shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship. Who does that? How many believers would be questioning who God is? Why would you do this? I don't understand why you've done this. And he'd done nothing to deserve it. God God picked him out to glorify him. Can we not be chosen by God to benefit his name and his kingdom? Take these words in in a different way today. See them for what they need to be so that when we enter into a time that Jesus warns us is unlike any other time, we will understand where we need to be. The same place that Job was in, on our knees, face down, in worship. What does Job do in the face of being stripped of everything? He submits and he reveals affection for his God. To fall to the ground in worship is a demonstration of great affection for God. Great affection. And he says, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Do we remember that? That what we have God's given us? See, we we get very clingy to our stuff because we think we've accomplished. We think that we have worked and gotten when everything that we have is what Job is saying. The Lord gave me all of this, and now he's taking it back. What do I have to gripe about? I didn't do this for myself. He recognizes. He has a lot. He was very comfortable. He managed a lot of stuff, but that's the key. He managed God's stuff. So if God took it back, what's he to say? 
wasn't his to begin with. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Wow. Do you want to be in that place? Do you re realize in that moment what a benefit to God's name that was out of Job's mouth in the face of Satan? Wow. What the Holy Spirit did through Job, this is all the Holy Spirit doing, but Job has to be willing to be used. He's a vessel willing to be used to this level. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Mark this, charging God with wrongdoing is sin. It is sin. God is good all the time. He never does anything wrong. So for us to say, God did this horrible thing to me, God is wrong in what he's done, is sin. Now, what does Mrs. Job reveal about herself? Remember what Satan had, had told um, God, oh, if you take all his stuff away, he'll curse you to your face. And God said, okay, go ahead. But what does the wife say to do? Curse God. The very thing that Satan said Job would do, Mrs. Job does. And she's, in one day, she's lost everything too. Job's test affected her in a big way. Their life is upside down. They have nothing. And what is his reply to his wife? You're talking, verse 10, you're talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? He doesn't have to understand. He just knows where he needs to be. In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. Job was a spiritual giant. He was spiritually rich. Job was living in true prosperity, spiritual prosperity. He had faith in God. He knew that God was his refuge. He knew that God was the supplier of everything that he needed and that if God had given him this, surely God could give him again if he so chose. This is the faith that you and I need to have. We also need to make sure that our trouble does not become our identity. Our identity is Christ, in Christ. Our trouble is separate, like our sin is. Keep them separate. Your trouble, your circumstances is something you're going through. It's not you. Your illness, your financial problems, your emotional, if you're emotionally drained, whatever you're dealing with, whatever relational troubles you may be having, it's separate from who you are. You are God's treasured possession. You are one that God loves. He is doing everything for your good. You are the apple of his eye. You are his precious child. He has promised never to leave you or forsake you. That is who you are. That is who you are. You're not your trouble. Your trouble is something you're dealing with. We've been dealing with trouble for a long time. Trouble comes and trouble goes. Sometimes we're afflicted with things that we have to deal with, like Job. Job is sitting there scraping off his boils and never once charging God with any wrongdoing, never once wavering in his love and devotion to the Lord. You and I get a hangnail and we're crying like a baby. Here's the clue to where we need to be. Are you close enough to Jesus to live this out? Whatever you're dealing with, are you close enough to him to live this out. Job was. He was close 
enough. He wasn't perfect in all that he did in the situation. And certainly his friends got the better of him. Not his circumstances, but his friends. So they were a bigger kind of trouble than the trouble that he got. A casual relationship with Christ will not get you here. A casual relationship with Christ is why most of the church will be purged out. They will not measure up. God will say, I don't know you. Away from me, evildoers. Philippians 1.27 says, Conduct yourselves. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Say it with me. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Whatever, whatever happens. Look at the life of Job. Be willing to do what is right. Isn't that what God told Cain? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? Can you not be a part of the family if you're willing to do what is right? But then James 4.17 says, If you do not do what is right, it's sin. Right doing is imperative to you and I. Living so close to Jesus that we can hear him when he whispers is imperative to us. And then whatever we're we're dealing with, that we glorify God. Lord, thank you. It's not easy to say thank you in the circumstances I find myself in because I'm going to get to see you work. The worse the situation, the greater God's power will be. That's why um, Paul says rejoice in every kind of trouble in your affliction because you're going to get to see something that other people aren't going to get to see. They're going to get to witness my power in their lives. What's better than that? In Jesus' day, people were living for miracles. Everybody wanted a miracle. And today, not much different. We want a miracle. We want a miracle. We want a miracle. Do we not see that God is working a daily miracle in our lives when he changes our hearts, when our filthy appetites are changed to holiness, when things that we used to do that brought Pain to God's heart and have not now been changed to being a benefit to his kingdom? That's the true miracle. God is working miracles in your life and mine, and they need to happen every day if we are to be his people and he is to be our God. And so God, in closing, I want to Tell us what the word James, James is a short book, but it is, it is a punch in the face to each one of us. So if you're feeling, not that you're supposed to live in your feelings, if you are feeling like you're not close to the Lord, then draw near. That's all you have to do. God, this is God's promise. So we need to read the word. He says, draw near to me. I'll draw near to you. Not I might if you kind of, you know, measure up. No, God says, draw near to me and I will draw. There's nothing that God wants to do more than be with us. He inhabits the praise of his people. He wants us to glory in his presence. And we must understand the responsibility, the accountability of being a part of his family.